we have with us today uh, someone from the, uh, the IMF in Washington, D.C. Uh, actually, this is the second time we've hosted uh, what's called the, uh, the World Economic Outlook presentation. Last year, uh, a similar presentation was made by uh, the two other authors from this chapter, uh, Dr. Rup Rupa uh, Dutagupta and John Ludorn. Uh, both were with us last year, and they presented a, uh, a chapter of the World Economic Outlook. Today, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Jaime Oato, uh, who will be speaking on the chapter uh, entitled Breaking Through the Frontier, Can Today's Dynamic Low-Income Countries Make It? Let me just read you the brief. The frequency of growth takeoffs in low-income countries has risen markedly during the past two decades, but these takeoffs have lasted longer than those that took place before the 1990s. Economic structure has not mattered much in spark takeoffs. Takeoffs have been achieved by LICs, rich in resources, and by those oriented towards manufacturing. A striking similarity between recent takeoffs and those before the 1990s is that they have been associated with higher with higher investment and national savings rates and stronger export growth, which sets them apart from LICs that were unable to take off and confirms the key role of capital accumulation and trade integration and development. However, recent takeoffs stand out from earlier takeoffs in two important aspects. First, today's dynamic LICs have achieved strong growth without building macroeconomic imbalances as reflected in declining inflation, more competitive exchange rates, and appreciably lower public and external debt accumulation. For resource-rich LICs, this has been due to a much greater resilience on foreign direct investment. For other LICs, strong growth was achieved despite lower investment levels than in the previous generation. Second, Recent takeoffs are associated with a faster pace of implementation of productivity enhancing structural reforms and stronger institutions, such as a lower regulatory burden, better infrastructure, higher education levels, and greater political stability. Looking forward, many challenges for maintaining the strong growth performance remain, however, including from the sources of growth being concentrated in a few sectors and the need to diversify their economies. Still, if today's dynamic LICs succeed in preserving their improved policy foundation and maintaining their momentum in structural reform, they would seem more likely to stay on course and avoid the reversals in economic fortunes that afflicted many dynamic LICs in the past. Our speaker today is Dr. Jaime Guajardo, Senior Economist at the Research Department International Monetary Fund. He has worked for three years at the World Economic Studies Division, which produces the World Economic Outlook. He has worked in a number of analytical chapters in the WEO, including those analyzing the macroeconomic effects of fiscal consolidation in advanced economies, on capital inflows to emerging market economies, and on the resilience of emerging market and developing economies. Dr. Guajardo is a Chilean citizen, obtained his PhD in economics at the University of California in Los Angeles, and worked at the time as a researcher at the Central Bank of Chile. Today's format is uh, Dr. Guajardo will do a presentation, uh, after which we can open the floor for question and answer. Dr. Guajardo. Thank you very much. have a good session when the chapter is about after the introduction. So this is chapter four of the, um, the World Economic Outlook, which is, was released last week. Is it working or not? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Right. So in the World Economic Outlook, the full uh, publication is going to be released on Tuesday morning in Washington DC time, so it's going to be at night over here. But the analytical chapters are, have already been released and you can find them in the website of the IMF. This is chapter four. In chapter four, we look at the recent performance of um, low-income countries. 
And basically, just to give you motivation, uh, why we take this topic, is that when we look at uh, what's been the growth of GDP per capita, so we look at the series of GDP per capita in PPP terms at 2005 prices. So it's a series of real GDP per capita. And what we have in this graph is basically the average uh, annual growth of GDP per capita by country groups, where the blue bar corresponds to the low-income countries, uh, the red bar corresponds to other emerging market and development economies, yeah, and the yellow bar to the advanced economies. Before I go into the numbers in here, let me just uh, tell you how we split the economy. So the advanced economies correspond to those countries that were members of the OECD in 1990, with the exception of Turkey. Then all the other economies are classified as emerging market or development, development economies. Then to separate them between uh, what we call low-income countries and what are the other emerging markets and developing economies, basically we uh, design an income threshold. If you are above that income threshold, then you are an emerging market economy. If you are below that income threshold, then you are low income economy. That income threshold was set to $2,600 in PPP terms in 1990. And then it was adjusted forward and backward with the average growth in GDP per capita for the world economy, which is about 2.3%. So that means that in 1950, if you had income per capita, annual income per capita was below 1,000, you were low income. By 2011, if your income per capita was below 4,000 in PPP terms, then you were low income. If you were above the threshold, then you would be among these other emerging market economies. So now turning, uh, coming back to the graph. So when we look at how low-income economies have performed, we see that low-income economies generally they grew uh, very little. The growth rate was relatively low, only about 1% during the 80s and during the first half of the 90s. Actually, our growth for low-income countries has been improving already since the second half of the 90s, although you cannot see it in this graph because in this graph we have just the average for the whole 90s. If you, if you look at what happened to growth in, this, in these economies during the 2000s, you're going to notice that growth of low-income countries increased significantly. And not only that, but it was higher than the average growth in the past economies in 1990. Now, if, if you want to put this in the context of, of theory, you would think that if you believe in neoclassical growth theory, you would believe that then poorer countries they should grow faster than rich countries because they would converge in their income levels over the long term. So that's something that we saw a bit during the 2000s. The low-income countries were growing faster than the advanced economies, but they were still not growing as fast as other emerging market economies. However, since the Great Recession, since 2008, low-income countries have been the group that has been growing the fastest. It's been growing faster than advanced economies and faster than emerging market economies. So basically when we see this picture, then what we want to answer and the question that we're asking in the chapter is whether um, is whether this good performance of uh, low-income countries that we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years, whether this is going to last or not. Okay? And you're going to see in the next slide that this is not a new phenomenon. In the past we've seen ways in which low-income countries have done well, however, have done well only for some time, and then their performance has deteriorated. And that particular case during the 60s and the 70s. During the 60s and the 70s, low-income countries in general grew well because of favorable uh, external conditions. The world economy was growing well, advanced economies were growing uh, at a very high rate. So that was a good period for low-income countries. But when, once oil prices start increasing, oil is rate in the advanced economy start increasing, uh, and oil prices started going down, many of these economies, low-income economies, uh, they didn't grow fast anymore. Their performance is here, right? Okay? So the question we're going to have now, then, during this recent episode, is whether we are, this time is different, 
whether the good performance of low-income countries is going to remain, or we think that it's going to remain over time, or whether uh, it's just a deja vu from the past. Okay? Now, how do we analyze the performance of low-income countries? So we didn't look at growth directly, but rather we look at the different objects. We, look, we looked at what we call growth the cost. Okay? There is a whole bunch of group of articles that define growth the cost as periods, extended periods of fast growth. And that's what we're doing here. Okay? So what we do is basically we look at GDP per capita in real terms for these low-income countries, and then we look at expansions, expansion experience in which GDP per capita is growing. Those expansions have to last at least five years in our definition. So a country has to be growing for at least five years, and the average growth in GDP per capita during those five years has to be at least 3.5%. Okay? Now, low-income countries, they generally have fast population growth. Okay? So you think that population growth is about 1.5, it means that we are looking in here a period in which uh, the growth in real GDP is about 5% in average during this five years. Okay? Uh, we implement that methodology to our series of real GDP per capita to over 60 countries that qualify as low-income countries according to our definition uh, since 1950, after 2011. And what we find is we find 26 episodes of uh, fast growth, or 26 take off after 1990, and 41 take off before 1990. Okay? In the chapter, there are two tables. I mean, if you want to take a look to the chapter later on, there are two tables where we list the episode. Which countries they are, and what are the period, which is the period in which they grew fast according to our definition. Once we have defined that that particular element, and then we look at the data from that lens. And that's what we have in this slide. So this slide, this particular chart, shows what is the proportion of low-income countries that was either uh, started in a growth takeoff or it was already in a growth takeoff in a given year. Okay? So, yes, let's uh, try to interpret this. So if we look at here during the 2000s, this graph is telling us that about 45%, so almost half of the sample of low-income countries, they were in a growth decor. So they've been growing, or they started growing at the, at the rate of at least 3.5%, and, and it was an expansion that would last at least five years. So you see that there have been a clear way, a clear increase in the number and the proportion of countries in a fast growth episode, in a growth takeoff since the mid-90s, and particularly during the 2000s. Okay? Now, this number of countries and the proportion fell somewhat uh, by the end of the sample for two reasons. Uh, the most obvious reason is the Great Recession, is the, is the, is the global crisis in the advanced economies, which reduced growth in some of these economies, once growth will be below 3.5%, then it's not going to be part of the same uh, growth takeoff anymore. And the second reason why this has fallen over here is because of censoring. Well, what do I mean by censoring? What I mean is our definition requires to have at least five years of strong growth. So if, if your growth fell in 2009, when it was the worst of the recession, but then you revived it and you grew fast, you grew fast in 2010 and 11. It's not going to appear in our graph because it's just two years. It doesn't fit to the five years that we require. That is going to appear only when we extend the sample after 2014. Okay? So that's why this falling here should be, I mean, shouldn't be taken literally. It actually is hiding a better performance than what it looks over here. But still, even with this issue of censoring, about one third of the of the low income economy we're still having pretty fast expansion. And in fact, of those, of all these countries that were in a, in a fast expansion right before the crisis, more than half continue in an expansion after the crisis. This is very impressive. And, uh, not all the world can say that they managed to 
past the crisis almost unscathed. I mean, with, with, no, with no issues. Now, uh, let's take a look a little bit to uh, the period before. So in the period before, we can see here that actually this, this phenomenon of a rapid increase in the number of countries having a growth take off is not new. It has happened before. And it has happened during the 60s up to the first half of the 70s. You see that the proportion of countries in, in a fast growth take off increased markedly. Up to about 40% of them were in, in, in a fast expansion during the 70s. However, many of them could not continue in that fast expansion afterwards. Remember that in 73 was when the world economy was hit by the first oil shock. Then in 1979 came the second oil shock and also the major increase in interest rates in the advanced economy. All those were negative shocks to, to emerging markets and developing economies. So that's part of the explanation why the performance of these countries worsened during this period. So what we want to, uh, uh, our question is over here then is, what can we say about this, this current episode? What can we say about the performance of these low-income countries going forward? Are they likely to continue performing well, or we're going to see something like we saw in the 60s and 70s? Okay? That's, that's basically the question that we want to ask. Now, we have some good reasons to think that uh, the performance is likely to be better and it's likely to go endure longer than what it did in the past. In fact, when we look at the median duration, so that means how long the expansion, the median duration for the episodes before 1990, the median duration was about seven years. So every country that had a growth takeoff usually managed to keep this fast expansion for, five, for seven years as a median value. Now, when we look at after 1990, this wave over here, we see that for those countries that they had an expansion, but the expansion already finished, the median duration was already higher, was about nine years. And for those that they have an expansion that is still ongoing, the duration is even longer, it's about 12 years. Okay? So they have already reached a longer expansion than what they did in the past. Second, is something that I don't have in the graph in here, but I will discuss in the chapter, the growth rates of this expansion after 1990 are a bit higher than the growth rate of the expansions before 1990. Remember that we have the 3.5 is the minimum growth that you have to have. But generally, the, the growth of these countries is above the 3.5. Okay? All right. <coughs> so once we discuss what is the growth of the cost, the initial question that you may have in mind is, well, does it matter? At the end of the day, you're just defining fast growth for five years. Does it really make a difference growing fast for five years? And what we see when we plot uh, our data is that it does make a difference. Okay? So when we group countries, those countries that manage to grow fast for at least five years, and we compare them to these other countries that did not manage to grow. In fact, the comparison is a bit it's not as clear as that, but uh, let, me, let me just discuss this graph and I'll tell you why it's not as clear. So basically, those countries that manage to take off, so this graph presents uh, the five years before takeoff, so minus four to zero, correspond to the period right before the country started growing fast. The takeoff starts in year one, so one to five is what we require with our methodology, we require GDP to grow at least 3.5%. Okay? Whatever happened after is just an additional gain. Okay? So when we look at the countries that managed to grow the car that grew fast, we see that GDP per capita increases much faster than those that didn't take off. And more importantly than that is that that good performance is not only for five years, but it continues.